Thanks to the Press Gallery Executive. I'm moderator today, and uh, I'm sort of waving down at the people who can't see me past this monitor here. Uh, we'll uh, start very shortly with a uh, prayer from Elder Claudette Commander of the Algonquin Nation, and uh, then we'll get into opening statements, then we'll get to the re four reporters in the room right now, and then to the phones. We're hoping to wrap this up by about 2.30. Uh, this is the Government of Canada Assembly of First Nations, Chiefs of Ontario, Nishnabi Aski Nation, and the Council for the Mushum and Trout Class Actions to provide an update on the negotiations related to the compensation and long-term reform of First Nations Child and Family Services. And speaking today, we have Patty Haidu, Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, David Lametti, Minister of Justice, Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse of the AFN, Grand Chief Joel Abram of the Chiefs of Ontario, Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse of the Nishwabi Aski Nation, Robert Kugler, David Stearns, and Joelle Walker. They are the counsels for the Mushroom and Trout class actions, and Elder Claudette Kameda, who is virtually on our screen very shortly to begin the prayer, if you would, Elder. Uh, are you on mute, uh, Ms. Commander? Well, I thought I was unmuted. Now I am. <laughs> so let me begin again by saying, Kwe Kakina, Kwe. Miigwech ki bija ego ma and Nishnabe ki o mama weneni wa bija jig. I bring greetings on behalf of the Algonquin Nation and I wish each and every one of you beautiful people Happy New Year. May this new year be filled with health, happiness, peace, to continue the good work, the good work that is need, so much needed for First Nations children and families, and to build this healing that we need from Canadians to Indigenous peoples. So I, I say, Chimi Wedge, thank you for being here. I welcome you into the territory of my people, and I acknowledge my ancestors, Nijen Wendaganuk, Omama Wendaniwak. I acknowledge the ancestors of all Indigenous peoples, First Nations people. I acknowledge everyone's ancestors. And let's acknowledge together with heart, with spirit, with voice, with kindness and love, the children. We are here today for First Nations children. We are here today for First Nations families. Let us ask the Creator to bless us as we embark on this important work for First Nations children. Miigwech kishiminado, miigwech, miigwech onje kakina. Miigwech kishiminado onje kizagi yediwin, miigwech. Miigwech jojo aki, miigwech koko mistipikizis, miigwech misho miskizis. And Creator, when we come together with that one mind, one heart, one spirit, and then one voice, we thank you, Miigwech Onje Kakina. I thank you for everyone, Miigwech Onje, for everything that you have blessed us with. We know, Creator, when we come together, we must always acknowledge that first mother, our mother the earth. We must always acknowledge that first grandmother and that first grandfather that you have blessed us with, our grandmother the moon and our grandfather the sun, and all our ancestors, Nijen Wendaganag. Kijiminado, ni buksendam onje kakina, nongom ni buksendam mashkawiziwin, ni buksendam mino, imadziwin, ni buksendam chimino togziwin. Miigwech kijiminado onje kiniwin emiyawin. Creator, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you, Creator, for the prayer that is said. We thank you, Creator, for hearing our prayer. We thank you, Creator. As we lift our hearts and our spirits and our, our heart as one for the children, continue to remember the children, continue to bless the children. And we ask you, Creator, to hold us in your love, to give us that strength that our eyes, our minds, our hearts and our spirit are open to see, to understand, and to always remember those that have been before us that told us to always remember the little ones, the children. And we acknowledge our ancestors, those, as the late Elmer Corshane, who always held the children so close in his heart. 
as we acknowledge and remember our elder, the late William Commander, those grandfathers that always said, remember the little ones. And Creator, we thank you for bringing us together. And Creator, my prayer are for all the leaders who have done good work for the children. Continue to bless them with Mashkawizewin. Continue to bless them with Akodeidewin, that courage. And we will do this together for the children. And I thank you, Creator, for hearing our prayer. Miigwech. Thank you. So, Minister Hadu, if you'd begin, please. Thank you. Kwekwe, hello, bonjour. It's such an honor to be with you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And thank you to Elder Commanda, who I've had the privilege of knowing for, for many years for that good opening and the reminder to keep the little ones at the center of everything we do. Such an important, uh, such an important point and really the focus of our, our announcement today. I'm also really honored to be here with many partners, including AFN Regional Chief Woodhouse beside me, uh, Chiefs of Ontario Grand Chief Joel Abram, Anishinaabe Aski Nation Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse, Robert Kugler, David Stearns, and Joelle Walker, representing the Mushroom and Trout, Trout Class actions, and of course my colleagues, Minister Miller and Minister Lametti. Before we get into today's announcement, however, I do want to speak briefly about the COVID uh, situation and latest outbreaks that are impa impacting Indigenous communities across the country. Um, I first want to thank the many Indigenous leaders and communities that have been working together so diligently over the last two years to protect each other through the various waves of this pandemic. But the highly infectious Omicron variant is again presenting significant risk to many communities and the number of people who are sick or who are isolating is rising. And not only are people's health and wellness threatened, but of course community services and the functioning of communities and those who can provide those services are stretched thin. My office and Indigenous Services Canada officials are in daily contact with community leadership and partners, not just to get updates, but also to confirm needed supports and put them in, pl in place. For example, in the case of Bearskin Lake First Nation, I've spoken personally with Chief Kaminawadaman, as well as Grand Chief uh, Derek Fox of Anishinaabe Aski Nation to check in, to confirm that the supports they've requested are arriving and are, are provided, and to make sure that we will continue to be there for the community in the way that they determine is the most helpful. In the case of Bearskin Lake, in addition to COVID-19 supports of almost 4 million since the beginning of March 2020, we've recently approved two additional funding allotments totaling about $900,000 and this is within days of receiving requests from the community. The funding will provide things like food security, PPE, local community COVID workers, perimeter security, essential supplies and of course wood cutting and collection that's needed to heat homes. We are also working with a variety of other communities across the country and the department is preparing to support increasing numbers of affected communities and will continue to be there for Indigenous communities to meet the needs as they determine as the most helpful. I do want to also take this moment to thank the many dedicated professionals, healthcare professionals and community members who are going above and beyond their regular duties to ensure that their colleagues, their neighbours and indeed uh, communities are fully supported during these exceptional times. We see you, we know just how uh, enormous these efforts are and we're very grateful. I will remind everyone that one way that we can all be useful to help bring down the number of people who become seriously ill with COVID-19 and, um, and to protect community functioning is to ensure that we are all as fully vaccinated as we are eligible, um, to support people who are unimmunized un or partially immunized or have not yet been able to receive a booster shot. Vaccination is indeed saving lives. It is also helping to reduce the strain on our, our healthcare systems. So turning now to today's announcement, I'm very pleased to announce that Canada and the parties have reached two significant agreements in principle. One that provides fair and equitable compensation to First Nations children and families harmed by discriminatory underfunding, and the other addressing the long-term reform that's needed for the First Nations Child and Family Services Program. I want to thank the parties that have worked all so hard and together. 
as I mentioned earlier, the Assembly of First Nations, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, Chiefs of Ontario, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, and Mashum Trout, as well as our own teams at Indigenous Services Canada and Justice Canada for staying at the table and working through these important and historic negotiations. So before speaking further, I'll turn it over to our other speakers today, starting with AFN Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Good afternoon to each and every one of you. Um, uh, for some of you that don't know, know me, my name is Cindy Woodhouse, and I'm uh, the Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief for the Manitoba Region. And I am chair of the Assembly of First Nations AFN Special Committee on Seeking Justice for Discrimination Against Our Children in this matter. Uh, I come from a, a small uh, community in, in Manitoba. It's called Penemutang. I was raised there with my mom and dad and my grandmothers and, and my whole family, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. But many children, um, sadly, were taken from our people and, and and they shouldn't have. And I'm I'm glad to be here today to, to speak about that. Kichimigwech, uh, Elder Commander, Chimigwech, for your prayers this morning, for our children, for our little ones, and for your constant love for our people. I want to thank you for that. I also want to um, thank Minister Miller, Minister Haidu, for inviting me today to be with you here at this very important announcement. And I want to acknowledge Minister Lametti. For, for being here virtually. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, Nishinaabe Aski Nation, Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse, for his work. You know, he was very instrumental in, um, you know, in, in, in making sure that we don't forget the remote communities in, in all of this. And to, and to Grand Chief Joel Abram for your support. And, um, you know, over the past uh, weeks and, and the past few months, you know, a lot of, and, and of course our, our lawyers and our, and our staff and, you know, people haven't had a Christmas yet, you know, where we've been working around the clock and I, I want to thank all of you for that. I know it's, I know it's been a long time and yeah, I also want to thank the, the work of, um, of our former national chiefs, you know, we've been working at this a long time. Um, you know, national chief, former National Chiefs Perry Bellegarde, you know, Phil Fontaine, um, Sean Athleo, and, you know, um, former National Chief Ovid Mekrity and, and many others. And, and also to our current National Chief, Roseanne Archibald, and the entire Executive Committee, you know, um, Ontario Regional Chief Glenn Hare and Saskatchewan Chief Bobby Cameron and and um, one of our other colleagues, Norm Yaklaya, who, who worked very hard on this, you know. And I also want to um, commend Dr. Cindy Blackstock and the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada for their commitment to this work. This historic settlement of $40 billion has been a long time coming. First Nations from across Canada have had to work very hard for this day to provide redress for monumental wrongs against First Nation children. Wrongs fueled by an inherently biased system. The Assembly of First Nations has been pressing this issue for more than 30 years, including strong advocacy by First Nations, right hold, rights holders and families. Persistence of the Assembly of First Nations in human rights proceedings, in the courts and now at the negotiation table. A human rights complaint launched in 2007 and our win at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and every effort to forge a path to end discrimination against First Nation children and families in the federal child welfare program to ensure that it never happens again. <clears throat> Discriminatory funding under the federal First Nations child and family services programs and other decisions has led to a massive overrepresentation of First Nations children into the child welfare system in every province and territory in this country. Every day for decades, First Nations children, some even newborns, have been ripped from their families and communities and many denied medical services and other supports when they've needed them. All at the hands of a federal child welfare program that should have protected them. More than 200,000 children and families are, are impacted by this compensation agreement. 
this wasn't and isn't about parenting. It's in fact about poverty. And First Nations children being removed from their families and communities instead of being provided help with food, clothing or shelter. The federal child welfare program was broken from the start. Most Canadians do not know this, that there was actually an incentive for child welfare agencies to remove children. In fact, a First Nations child welfare agency would not receive funding unless the child was removed from their home and placed into foster care. And until recently, the federal government's narrow implementation of Jordan's principle resulted in First Nations children being denied medical and other services, in some cases forced the parents to place their children into care. We have a long way to go. To address the poverty in our nations, and no amount of money will ever be the right amount, nor will it bring back a childhood lost, but today is about acknowledgement, about being seen and heard. Today is about a plan for the future. With First Nations, defining and determining a path forward, grounded in our rights and the common goal to have our children succeed. Today is about achieving for First Nations and for our country. At the AFN, our efforts have been and will continue to be about removing barriers that keep our kids down, creating a new process that will allow our kids to thrive and reach their full potential with strong connections to their languages, cultures, nations and to their families. I have a message for three groups of people today. To the tens of thousands of First Nations children who were removed from their families, their nations and their cultures. Two, First Nations children and families in communities today who are still dealing with a broken system. And finally, to Canadians who may not realize that these harmful, discriminatory practices were and are still taking place. First, to the children and the families who have been impacted by the Federal Child and Family Services Program and to those who have impacted by a narrow implementation of Jordan's principle. I acknowledge your pain and your loss the loss of time and a fam and family life with your siblings. I'm sorry you didn't, ha didn't have that. Your parents, your aunties and your elders. You are heard, you are seen. Compensation and reform will not bring that time back to you, but it is my hope that it will change the course of our families and communities starting today. Secondly, to the First Nations children and families who are still tangled in this system, the Assembly of First Nations will be working with the experts, including those with lived experiences, to make sure that we make change that can be seen, felt and measured. And finally, I want to speak to Canadians. In the past 12 months, you have walked with us with the discovery of unmarked graves at sites of former residential schools. You're learning things my people have known and have lived. The children lost at residential schools and the many survivors are the ancestors of the children experiencing similar harms today, including those of the 60s scoop, day, uh, day school survivors, and now, and now this. More than 200,000 First Nations children and youth who were removed from their homes and nations or denied services under Jordan's principle could be eligible for compensation. And all of our children and communities going forward will benefit from the 19.8 billion in new investments and First Nation designs program, design program and services to deal with the root causes of family breakdown, like substandard housing, poverty, substance abuse, and multi-generational trauma. Over the coming months, the AFN and the Government of Canada will determine a full compensation package in a final settlement agreement. The final settlement agreement will contain provisions on eligibility for compensation and the application process. Work towards long-term reform will include AFN facilitated engagement sessions with all regions. Engagement with First Nations will guide our negotiations with the federal government to ensure the reform program is relevant and responsive to the needs of First Nations children and families across the country. I'm very proud to have been, been at the negotiating table for the Assembly of First Nations. 
Today is a culmination of, again, more than 30 years of hard work and advocacy grounded in First Nations rights, fairness and equity for our children and their families. We've delivered, and I'm so very proud of our efforts and what this will mean for our people. I acknowledge the hard work and the dedications of the rights holders at, at the table and Senator Murray Sinclair for chairing the negotiations that help, helped us reach these agree, historic agreements in principle. I also acknowledge the work and commit, commitments of Ministers uh, Mark Miller and Minister Patty Haidu and, and all of your officials, as well as the support of um, Prime Minister Trudeau. You know, I want to thank you, Prime Minister, for for you know taking this very seriously and making sure that that this had happened and that we didn't end up you know where we don't want to be and i thank him for that um and we will hold you all to this path <laughs> yeah i am confident and i am optimistic that we are on a path that will support first nations children have a life and every opportunity that every single one of them deserves chimigwech thank you Uh, next, we have uh, Chiefs of Ontario Grand Chief Joel Abram. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the Elder for her uh, opening prayer, opening this up in a good way, and also for the uh, comments of Regional Chief Woodhouse, and uh, thank you for leading the discussion. Um, this agreement in principle will initiate uh, long-term reforms that ensure First Nations that culturally appropriate supports and prevention services are available to pre uh, families. It'll also increase funding available for First Nation representative services and will provide culturally grounded uh, protection approaches and prevention approaches that allow First Nations youth to remain connected to their language and culture and safely within their homes and their communities. Um, and today's announcement brings us one step closer to addressing discrimination in child welfare and achieving substantive equality for First Nations children. It also marks the beginning of an important journey to ensure all First Nations have a solid foundation for moving forward and improving the quality of life for future generations. On behalf of the Ontario Leadership Council, we call upon the Government of Canada and all Canadians to see this through. I'd also like to uh, thank the survivors and the families for their bravery and sharing their lived experiences and stories. And uh, we will stand with you and continue to ensure your voices are heard and honoured. Also, thank you to Cindy Blackstock, who a lot of this uh, would not have happened without her intervention in the First uh, Nations Child Family Caring Society and uh, beginning the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal Challenge and uh, resulting in a lot of the orders that have led to the path where we are today. And so, um, you know, it's all about uh, making sure that, you know, there's no overrepresentation of First Nations children in the welfare system uh, going into the future. Uh, and also in the past of righting some of the wrongs that have been done. And we can't forget that, uh, you know, this happened because of discrimination. And we still have a lot of work to do in tackling the root causes of this dis discrimination. You know, and I've talked with Minister Alamedi on this several times, uh, which is about the impact of the doctrine of discovery on Indigenous people in North America and uh, how we have to begin to move past that, you know, in order to uh, really dig at the roots of uh, colonialism and uh, the paternalism that came along with that, that so negatively impacted uh, Indigenous uh, families, uh, you know, not only in Canada, but to the United States as well. Um, and I've often said that uh, the child welfare is the new residential schools in terms of impact on First Nations uh, families and children. And uh, it's time that we begin to turn that tide. And I think today is a, is a very good step on doing that in uh, Canada living up to you know, um, settling down and, and uh, coming up with this agreement. And there's still some work to do, you know, in the future, a lot of hard work to get where we need to be at the end of the day. Uh, but again, I'm very thankful that we are where we are today. And uh, it's part of uh, my, my culture as well is to make sure that we're, we're thankful for the things that we have. And so I'm very thankful today for uh, this agreement principle and I'm um, uh, willing to roll up. We're gonna be rolling up our sleeves uh, to move forward to ensure that this agreement uh, comes to a final uh, disposition um, and then we can then you know get to the hard work of changing child the face of child welfare and uh, you know, making um, you know making up for past wrongs and just moving forward together on a good foot and uh, also you know getting back to the original relationship uh, that which uh, in our culture is based on uh, through a wampum 
um, where we were, uh, you know, Canada's in their canoe with their laws and their, and their people and their, and their customs. And uh, we're traveling down a river of life parallel, uh, you know, with First Nations people in our canoes uh, with their laws and our children. And so, again, this is also about, you know, uh, recognizing and uh, ensuring that First Nations jurisdiction of their children is respected and, uh, you know, making sure that overrepresentation in child welfare goes down. And it's not just about child welfare, it's about you know, lack of clean drinking water, it's about lack of housing, it's about uh, a dozen different areas uh, where discrimination is happening. So um, you know, I'm glad that uh, you know, I was a little bit a part of this unit and other things as well. So I'm, I'm just really looking forward to moving forward uh, to do better for uh, our indigenous people across Canada. And uh, so again, I'd like to thank everyone, all our team in Ontario for their hard work, the technical folks, our legal weapon that came together to make this happen. And, uh, also the efforts of Canada and all the other uh, parties that were involved in this. So again, I'd like to thank you all for your uh, you know, input into this and coming together. So on behalf of our children and the faces yet to come, this is a great step. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grand Chief Joel Abram. And now I'll turn to Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse for a few words from Nishnabi Aski Nation. Bonjour and uh, watchie. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, first acknowledging uh, the prayer from uh, Elder uh, Commander. Uh, also, uh, I'm joining you today from the offices of uh, Nishnabiaski Nation here in Thunder Bay in the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation. Uh, the Ojibwe is on the western shores of uh, Lake Superior and signatories to the Robinson Tre Treaty area of 1850. I apologize that um, I cannot be uh, with you all in Ottawa, but I acknowledge the peoples and lands on which that you are uh, communicating to us from, which is the uh, Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. So I bring greetings from Anishinaabe Aski Nation, the territory from Treaty 9 and Treaty 5 communities within the province of Ontario. Uh, our territory occupies two thirds of the province. And as, as you uh, would see, it, our, our area is very vast. And, uh, and very uh, many of our communities are remote. We have 34 communities that are fly-in, but still our road access communities has various degrees of uh, remoteness. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Bearskin First Nation and all of our communities that are dealing with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I was informed that uh, there's close to 10 communities now within Nishinaabiaski Nation that is affected uh, by this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, these are some of the challenges that we bring that we want to give light uh, to this process, um, this AIP process and the work that uh, we've been doing uh, with all partners uh, to really bring light, the real challenges uh, of our remote communities, of our First Nation communities within the Shinabiaski Nation. Recently, I spoke with visitors of uh, Kingfisher Lake First Nation, one of our 39 First, uh, First Nation communities that Mishnabiaski Nation represents. Grocery delivers to the community store has not come in. You know, the shelves were bare most of the week due to freight delays. That's life in the North, the remote North. When I go to a Northern store in any of our First Nation communities, you would be shocked at what we have to pay for an apple, for chicken soup, for vitamin C, or healthy vegetables, if we can even get them within our communities. So how are we supposed to combat and uh, COVID-19 and also bring these resources to our children uh, when, we, when our community stores can't even uh, put these on the shelves? That's life in the remote North. Sandy Lake, one of our remote communities, a four-year-old named Brody Mikas passed away from strep throat because he was sent home with Tylenol. There's no antibiotics in the community at that time. That, ladies and gentlemen, is life in the North. And these are the same challenges faced by remote communities uh, across the country. Uh, I've been ca getting calls from various uh, chiefs uh, uh, across this country saying that, yes, like we, we are facing the same, uh, we are facing the same challenges that uh, you know, access and lack of infrastructure and lack of capital uh, within our communities, which still perpetuates uh, the discrimination against our children. 
So that is life in the North. Uh, all these areas, these challenges that we face uh, add to our youth suicide rate, our opioid crises, the realities of intergenerational trauma that are interconnected. Tragically, these experiences are not uncommon in our First Nation community. They scar our children, our youth, and our families every single day. For our remote communities, empirical math-based solutions to these problems have been unheard of. I'm proud that we have finally identified a promising way forward in this agreement in principle through meaningful structural change. You will agree that a dollar in Toronto is different than a dollar in Atwapiska. So these are areas that we also want to focus uh, within uh, our participation uh, in this uh, AIP. Through the creation and support for the National Assembly of Remote Communities, uh, we have created a collective voice for remote communities across the country. And through a remoteness secretariat to collect and study data on issues of remoteness affecting our communities, we can finally put the realities of life in the North and the challenges of our community space on the map in a meaningful uh, right way across the country. For the first time, I'm very uh, encouraged to say that this deal puts us on a path to quantifying and indexing remoteness on a national scale. For the first time, math and science will dictate the numbers. This is what it costs to deliver child and family services in our communities. This is what it's gonna to cost to keep meaningful, to keep uh, professionals in our communities, uh, to service our children, our youth and families. This is what it's actually gonna to cost to end the discrimination within our remote communities. I'm therefore pleased and honored to have signed this agreement in principle on behalf of our First Nations at Anishinaabeaski Nation. We have joined with leadership from other remote communities across the country to break new ground on overcoming the barriers we face by establishing structural reforms specifically directed at our remoteness. I'm especially pleased that our Choose Life program, Choose Life, that provides essential suicide prevention supports for our youth will be enhanced through long-term reform and sustainable funding and will be extended across the country. I really thank also uh, Minister Haiju and Minister Miller and your team as well for working with our, our team at Anishinaabeaski Nation to ensure that uh, these areas of uh, access and remoteness are included in this AIP. And uh, we have a long way to go, uh, but I think I'm very uh, encouraged that, uh, you know, in terms of moving ahead together, uh, we will uh, uh, deal with and overcome these challenges that I have. As I conclude, I'd like to say a heartfelt miigwech to the leaders and members of all the negotiating team that that's been uh, happening for the past couple of months. I acknowledge the significant contributions of Assembly First Nations, specifically Regional Chief Woodhouse. Uh, thank you for your support and also your guidance uh, in this work as well. The Chiefs of Ontario, uh, Grand Chief Abram, and your important work that you bring to the table as well and, and your expertise. And also the newly established National Assembly of Remote Communities, the, NA, the NARC. I, we're looking forward to working together to really bring uh, solutions and uh, community-based solutions to uh, remoteness challenges. And of course, also to the Caring Society uh, and Cindy Blackstock uh, to reach this landmark agreement with our federal treaty partner. And I would especially like to thank Honorable Murray Sinclair uh, for sharing his guidance and wisdom while facilitating these negotiations. Ladies and gentlemen, chiefs, everyone, what do we have accomplished here together? we have done in a good way. Today is a good day for the people of Anishinaabeaski Nation. I know we are still under the shroud of COVID-19 and dealing with uh, uh, this pandemic in our North, but uh, these are ways in which we'll have meaningful discussions and meaningful dialogue and meaningful negotiations to really address uh, the challenges of our people within the North and also to nations across the country. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone.
Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse. And now I'll turn to Robert Kugler, David Stearns, and Joelle Walker for some words uh, in their representation of the Mishuman Trout class actions. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is David Stearns. I'll be speaking on behalf of the group. Is there any questions in French? Uh, my colleague Robert Kugler will answer them. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Miigwech. Uh, I'd like to thank the elder for her uh, her opening prayer and acknowledge um, uh, the attendance of Regional Chief Woodhouse, uh, Grand Chief uh, Abram, Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse, the ministers of the Crown, and we'd also like to thank the ministers for inviting us to this press conference. Um, as I said, my name is David Stearns. I'm with the firm Soros LLP in Toronto. I'm joined by Robert Kugler of the law firm Kugler Candiston, based in the province of Quebec, and Joel Walker of the law firm Miller Tiddley in British Columbia. We act for the plaintiffs in two class actions brought on behalf of First Nations youth and their caregivers. Uh, we're also working in close collaboration with counsel for the Assembly of First Nations and their representative plaintiffs, and have uh, also worked in, collabor in collaboration with and benefited greatly from the expertise and assistance of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, led by Dr. Cindy Blackstock and their counsel. Um, this case followed on a landmark decision of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. It's a decision which I hope children in all the schools in Canada will eventually be taught about and will learn about the way that American children learn about Brown versus Board of Education in the United States. It is that significant a decision and it played a tremendous role in the class action that we brought and in the historic settlement that has been reached. The historic settlement reached on Friday will result in $20 billion in compensation being paid to the following three groups of individuals. First, First Nations children who were living on reserves or in the Yukon and who were taken from their homes and placed in state care at any time from 1991 until the present. Second, First Nations children in Canada, whether living on or off reserve, who were deprived of essential services or who experienced delays in receiving essential services from a government, whether it be the provincial or the federal government. This subclass goes from 1991 to 2017. Third, certain of the family caregivers of these children. I want to begin, though, by speaking through you, the media, to the children and the young adults who are in this class action. This case is for you. This settlement is for you. This settlement will provide some compensation to you for your suffering. We know it is very important to you, and we know that you have questions such as, am I in the class? Where do I sign up? How do I get information? And importantly, when will I receive compensation? In an effort to answer some of these questions, we have prepared a list of answers to frequently asked questions in English and French, and we will provide the link and we will ask the media to share that link so that children and young adults and their caregivers can get the best information, the most timely information that we have. Some of these questions we don't have the complete answers to yet, but we will want to try to get as much information to you as we can at the earliest time. Let me also uh, say that in order to receive information, the best thing that you can do is to register on our firm's website, which is, and it's the same in English and French, www.sotosclassactions.com and go to First Nations case. And that is a bilingual website, but the URL is the same in English and French. Even if you are not sure if you qualify, please register. It's quick, you sign up, and as information becomes available, we will send it to you. We are also uh, more than happy to answer your inquiries, but we do ask that you be patient as there are a number of people that we are trying to reach. Uh, we will respond to you. This settlement is the largest class action settlement in Canadian history, and it is believed to be one of the largest anywhere in the world. It is important to point out that all of the $20 billion of this settlement will go to the class members. The costs of administering the settlement and legal fees 
will be paid over and above this amount once determined and once approved by the court. The enormity of this settlement is due to one reason and one reason only, and that is the sheer size and scope of the harm that was inflicted on the class members as a result of a cruel and discriminatory First Nations family and child welfare system that Canada has now finally taken major steps to overhaul. It is our sincere hope that this money will provide some comfort to each member of the class and help them with the difficult process of rebuilding their lives. I would like to say a special mention to the representative plaintiffs. In a class action, certain people known as the representative plaintiffs put their name forward and put their stories forward in a statement of claim so that the claim can be brought before the court on behalf of a much larger group, in this case, a group consisting of hundreds of thousands of people. And I'd like to say a special word about the young man whose name is attached to this historic case, Xavier Mouchoum, Xavier Mouchoum in English. Xavier trusted us to tell his story in the hope that this lawsuit would help change a discriminatory system and provide financial support to the children who suffered under it. Xavier was born into the Anishinaabe nation in Lac Simon, Quebec. When he was nine years old, he was removed from his family for reasons which he still does not know and placed into foster care. From the age of nine until 18, Xavier was transferred to 14 different foster homes. He was placed and he was removed from 14 different foster homes. He lost his native Algonquin language, his culture, and his ties to the Lac Simon community. At the age of 18, Xavier was forced to leave his foster family and fend for himself because Canada did not fund at the time post-majority services for First Nations individuals. It has been found by the tribunal in the decision which I mentioned that the child welfare system that was behind the removal of Xavier, his brother, and tens of thousands of other First Nations youth like him was a system organized around discrimination and colonial views about First Nations families and youth. In fact, as regional chief Woodhouse mentioned, it was the policy of the Canadian government that removal of First Nations children living on reserves from their homes ought to be a first resort for any child in need of assistance, as opposed to a last resort. That is the opposite of how child welfare is supposed to work, and in fact, how it does work for children who are not living on reserves. The discriminatory removal resulted in an epidemic of foster care, also referred to sometimes as the Millennium Scoop. As found by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, more First Nations children were living in foster care than were living in residential schools at their height. Another young man who has led this cause is Jeremy Miwazigi, M-E-A-W-A-S-I-G-E. Jeremy is a member of the Pictou Landing First Nation in Nova Scotia. He was born in 1994 and has suffered from multiple disabilities and high care needs throughout his life. Jeremy was deprived of essential services because of jurisdictional disputes among governments and government departments. Together with his brother and litigation guardian, Jonathan, and their late mother, Marina Beatles, Jeremy has been a champion in the fight against discrimination that uh, fight against discriminatory government policies that breached their constitutional equality rights in what is now known as Jordan's principle. I referred at the beginning to two class action lawsuits. The first one, the Mushum class action I've mentioned. The second lawsuit was brought to address children and families impacted by Jordan's principle prior to 2007. The representative plaintiff in that case is the father of two, two children who suffered grievously from a system and from governments who focused on jurisdiction and petty interdepartmental disputes rather than the medical needs of children. Zach Trout from the Cross Lake First Nation in Manitoba is the father of his late daughter and son named Sene and Jacob, who died at a young age from Batten disease. Zach's children were deprived of basic medical necessities during their short lives. For years, 
Zach and his wife were forced to reuse needles and feeding tubes because these necessities fell into service gaps. He and his children and his wife suffered for years under a cruel government policy. There are a number of other representative plaintiffs who have equally compelling stories and who have courageously come forward to allow us to bring this action. I will not go name them all. Their names can be found on the consolidated statement of claim found on our website, www.sotosclassactions.com. Our goals in bringing these class actions were twofold. We wanted to ensure that individuals who had suffered significant harm under the discriminatory child welfare system or were denied or delayed essential services received by non-First Nations children like Zebi Bashu, Jeremy Mizwahi, Mizwahi, Miwazegi, I beg your pardon, and the late Sene and Jacob Trout receive compensation that reflects the harm that they each suffered as a result of that discrimination. For Xavier and the children who were removed and experienced the life-altering trauma of extended displacement from home and community, any settlement had to offer them far more than the maximum of $40,000 per individual awarded by the tribunal in its 2019 compensation decision. We also wanted to significantly expand the group of individuals entitled to receive compensation. The CHRT decision awards compensation going back only to 2006, whereas this class action goes back to 1991 and compensation under this settlement will be paid to individuals who suffered discrimination going back all the way to 1991. With this historic settlement, we've accomplished both of these goals. Those who are the most affected by discriminatory conduct will receive significantly more than $40,000 in compensation. And class members who were removed from their homes or were denied their equality rights under Jordan's principle going back to 1991 will be compensated. When we entered into settlement discussions, we said we wanted to arrive at a settlement that Canadians could be proud of. This is such a settlement. Informed Canadians who understand the degree of suffering and harm will be proud of this settlement. There are many details to be worked out before we can begin distributing funds to class members. Over the next several months, we will be consulting with experts, First Nations communities, the Assembly of First Nations, and, and the uh, First Nations Family and Child Caring Society to ensure that the distribution of funds is carried out efficiently and in a manner that is culturally sensitive and that recognizes the youth and the vulnerability of many members of this class. We are also aware of lessons learned from previous settlements, such as the Indian Residential School settlement, and are committed to ensuring that the settlement structure and distribution will reflect those lessons. Once we've determined how the funds will be distributed, we will seek approval of the entire settlement and the distribution plan from the federal court and begin to distribute money to class members. And we hope that we can accomplish all of this and begin distribution within this calendar year. Once again, uh, thank you to the ministers for inviting us to the press conference. And those are our remarks. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. And also thank you for highlighting just how devastating this, uh, this legacy of discrimination has been using um, some very specific cases. Thank you. And I think it really highlights that uh, no amount of compensation can make up for the traumas that First Nations children, families and communities have experienced. But this will begin the process of healing and it will support uh, families on that journey of healing. It will support individuals who have experienced extraordinary loss and harm. Um, it will stop the discrimination and it will support First Nations led long term reform. These agreements in principle amount to a total of about $40 billion. Approximately $20 billion will be provided in compensation for First Nations children on reserve and in the Yukon who were removed from their homes 
and their parents or caregivers due to discriminatory underfunding of the First Nations Child and Family Services Program. This also includes those who were impacted by the government's narrow definition of Jordan's principle. Our shared goal is to reach that final settlement agreement, those final settlement agreements as soon as possible so that compensation can be delivered quickly and fairly. Approximately $20 billion over the next five years will be invested to reform the First Nations Child and Family Services Program and begin the work to reform Jordan's principle and other departmental initiatives. Some of these reforms, including preventative measures to keep families and children together, will be implemented as early as April of 2022. Through the agreement in principle on long-term reform and child and family services, the system will be reformed by focusing first and foremost on prevention. First Nations and First Nations child and family service providers will be better positioned to address the factors that lead to First Nations children being taken into care. They will have that stable and predictable funding that will help them to keep their children with their families and in communities. The funding includes significant investments in on-reserve housing and other major capital related to the delivery of critical child and family services and Jordan's principle. Simply, and I think other speakers have said this, poverty cannot be a reason that a child cannot stay with their family. New continue. We will continue to implement Jordan's principle to make sure that First Nation children can continue to have access to products, services, and supports that they need. We will do it in partnership with First Nations, the provinces, and territories in order to develop approaches that are long-term and that will fill in the gaps and make sure that we reach equality for First Nations children. They need to be with their families and their loved ones to thrive. Societies that place their children first are the strongest, most resilient, and most prosperous. This new path puts First Nations children first to help them thrive and grow, surrounded by their cultures and their loved ones. It provides a new path for community wellness and success. It is an investment in the future of our country. Now that Canada and the parties have signed these agreements in principle, we'll focus on finalizing the settlement agreements. And we look forward to immediately beginning this work with all of the parties. And as much as I'm pleased to say that we've reached this critical step to end litigation and the underlying discrimination, this is indeed a day for reflection. It's an acknowledgement of the extreme harms and grief that too many families continue to live with each and every day. It's an acknowledgement of a country that knowingly underfunded First Nations communities and care, and it led to compounding and ongoing loss. Canada's decisions and actions harmed First Nations children, families, and communities. Discrimination caused intergenerational harm and loss, and those losses are not reversible. But I believe that healing is possible if we look face on at the harms caused, if we compensate, and most importantly, if we end the discrimination once and for all. The work that we've done together is a huge step towards a future where every First Nations child has a fair chance to succeed and every chance to thrive in their home and their community. We are determined to move forward with our partners of the First Nations including those who joined me today for today's announcement. Today's announcement is an important step. I want to express my gratitude to Honourable Murray Sinclair and his entire team for facilitating this work. His leadership, his immense experience and his wisdom guided all of us and helped us stay focused on our shared goal of equity and wellness for First Nations children and their families. And to all of the parties again, I'm grateful for all of your contributions, your willingness to sit at the table with Canada, and your dedication to future generations. I'll now turn to Minister Miller. Thank you. Kwe Kwe. Hello, bonjour. I want to thank Elder Commander for opening in a good way this um, historic announcement. Thank you, Minister Haidu for giving that overview of the agreements in principle that'll and what it'll mean for what it'll mean for First Nations children going forward as well as the speakers that preceded her and and outlined what this means so eloquently. Tel que mentionné les accords 
as mentioned, the AIPs that we've reached plan for an investment of about $40 billion. $20 billion of these funds will compensate First Nation children on reserve and in the Yukon that were removed by their families by child welfare services. This also includes children who were affected by the narrow application of the Jordan Principle. Our common goal is to reach an agreement as quickly as possible to compensate the families. Another $20 billion will be invested to have a long-term reform of child and family services for First Nations and Jordan's principle across Canada. Some of these measures include preventive measures to keep families together, and they will be implemented as soon as April 2022 of this, of this year. We are extremely grateful to all parties that presented themselves at the negotiations table and who stayed there. We would like to thank the Assembly of First Nations, the Caring Society, the Chiefs of Ontario, the Nishnabe Aski Nation and the Mishum and Trout class actions for their common work on this process. I would also like to thank the Honourable Murray St. Clair and his team for facilitating this negotiation that was not easy. We would not be here without you, Mr. St. Clair. Residential schools survivors have made the J Jordan's principle their main call to action. We have to accomplish the work that they asked us to do. We have to focus on the health and well-being of the young people and families of First Nations. I don't think it was in anyone's interest to go to court on these issues. Reconciliation has to be focused on respectful relationships, dialogue. Potential schools identified child welfare and Jordan's principles as, and Jordan's principle as their top calls to action. We must do the work that they asked us to do by focusing on the health and well-being of First Nations children, youth and families. Over the last six months, I've had the opportunity to visit over a half dozen sites of former residential institutions and speak to many survivors. And while many spoke of their unspeakable, horrific experiences, while others continue to suffer in silence, there was a common feeling and message of hope for the next generation, of hope that we would bring and break the model of removing children from their communities, of ensuring the children are brought up surrounded by their loved ones. Along with the investments that we're currently making in education, today's announcement does fuel that hope. But we must recognize that there is an immense amount of work left to be done. I strongly believe that it's in no one's interest to address these issues through litigation in court. A lot has been achieved in six short weeks outside the courts by speaking to each other. This is the largest settlement in Canadian history. But no amount of money can reverse the harms experienced by First Nations children. However, historic injustices require historic reparations. Equally important, the agreement on long-term reform addresses the factors that lead to children being taken into care in the first place and makes sure that First Nations and Child and Family Services agents have, agencies have stable and predictable funding to deliver the supports that are essential to keeping children with their families and communities. The agreements in principle we have signed today will support First Nations children so that they can have the same opportunities to grow up with their families and communities thriving through their cultures and languages. As a next step and a difficult one, Canada and the parties will negotiate a final settlement agreement which will map out how compensation will flow to First Nations children and families, it will establish a framework for long-term funding to improve services for children and families. We know there is a lot of work to do to make sure that children are fully protected against all forms of violence and discrimination, according to the UNDRIP. We are eager to continue this work in close collaboration with our partners at First Nations. Practices that are still in place today can no longer continue. It's Canada's responsibility to right past wrongs and end racism and discrimination against Indigenous children, and to do this, We'll keep putting Indigenous children and youth at the centre of all we do so that they can grow up happy, healthy and in their communities where they belong. 
And finally, as we reflect on a country that we want to live in, we need to ask ourselves what a healed country looks like. And I don't have the answer to that, but I do believe these agreements, the ones that were reached last week, are a step in that direction. Thank you. Merci, miigwech. Hi, everyone. It's Chris Rams, the moderator again. Uh, we have five journalists in the room. We're going to go through the five. One question, one follow-up. Then we'll move to the phones. We've got about a half hour for Q&A, so please keep your questions short. And everyone who's answering, please keep your answers tight, please. Go ahead, please, uh, Laurence. Uh, bonjour, Laurence. Hello, this is Laurence Martin from Radio Canada. My question is for Mr. Miller. In terms of compensation, I understand that we don't know the details yet. The Human Rights Tribunal, tribunal said it was about $40,000 per child. You said that you would like to have some variability according to the harm that was uh, experienced. Is $40,000 the minimum for you? Answer, this is the commitment I made, especially for children that were removed from their community. This commitment stands as said Mr. Stern. There are many details that still need to be detailed, and it includes more than just the decision from the Human Rights Tribunal. So this information is to come and will be part of the discussions that we'll have and is part of the commitment that we've made to Dr. Blackstock. Thank you. You also talked about reforming the system, the child welfare program, to have initiatives to make sure that Indigenous children can stay with their families. Can you give us concrete examples of initiatives and programs that could be funded to make sure that children stay with their families? Answer. As it is mentioned in the AIP, as part of a as soon as April 2022, we will be enacting prevention programs. Everything depends on the community. There are many um, modalities depending on the community. There are even leisure activities, sports that will be funded. This broken system was forcing us to intervene rather than to prevent. And of course, and of course prevention is less attractive, but it is so important. And we're trying to avoid intervention. So there could be all sorts of activities this can include reforming the Jordan's principle. Many communities have asked us for support. To uh, instead of intervening to prevent, so it really all depends on the community. But what we heard loud and clear is the spirit of C92 is to have a an approach that is focused on auto-determination of the communities. I could really tell you everything that we're doing throughout the country, but it includes activities that are not generally thought of to be funded in something in the framework of uh, indigenous programs. It could be social intervention, it could be recreation, it could be support workers. I'm giving you examples, but it's really all sorts of things that can exist. Intervention could also include language courses. By nature, these have to reflect the needs of the community and be achieved through auto-determination as planned for by the Bill C-92. It, you talked about it being 30 years that you've been battling uh, for this kind of at least acknowledgement, and it's been 14 years, I think, since the Human Rights Tribunal case was first launched. An entire generation of kids has been harmed just since then. Can you talk about the frustration of how long this has taken and why you seem to have more hope today that this is going to reach an actual conclusion? Well, I <clears throat> thank you for the question. You know, I, we've been at this now um, absolutely for 30 years. You know, many of uh, the leaders before before myself, many, many leaders that have come and gone, many of our, pre like I had mentioned, our previous national chiefs, we've been fighting for, you know, equality in this country. Uh, you know, after, after residential schools, after um, the 60s scoop, uh, you know, after Indian Day School and all these things, and I'm glad that that this government is finally um, listening to some of the things that we're we're asking them to to try and um, to try and fix with us, and and also to 
to give us the tools that we need as First Nations to be in the driver's seat because for far too long, um, you know, uh, it's been patriarchal on our people. And that has to stop. That colonial thinking has to stop. And it has to, um, the solutions on many of these issues are right in our communities with our elders, with our people, with our youth, with, with our leadership and with our people in our communities. We have the solutions and we just, you know, we need to um, not be held back with, with doing things, that, you know, going back to our original, you know, the original ways that we used to do things as families and not just taking, taking from us. Thank you. I'm not sure who will be the best to answer this, but Minister Miller, you mentioned that nobody really wants to fight this in court or feels like litigation is the best way, except until now that has been the only way the government has been dealing with this. Is the government then withdrawing its appeal and is it committing to not challenge these in court any further? And I think the, the second part of that question is, is best handled by, by Minister Lametti, who's with us here today. But I would say this. Um, as mentioned by, by David Stearns, uh, this is the, um, the culmination of, of three class actions that are overlapping to some extent and a ground mark decision by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal that accorded $40,000 to each removed child. But it is a much broader class than that. And so um, I'm not going to bore everyone with the inner workings of cabinet and, and the decision-making process that, that freed up about $40 billion. It, it is a quite an intricate one, but today is really about the kids, uh, and we have to remember that at every step of the way. Um, but when the Prime Minister gave us our mandates and said, solve this, um, three other class actions popped up. So that is not without um, some complexity. For the last two years, our teams have been working together to come up with a model that doesn't re-traumatize children, some very young, as they achieve this compensation that we've been dedicated towards. So it has been a complicated process, and parties have been working together. But the, really, the last six weeks, when we looked and said to ourselves, um, do we cease the appeal? And what happens if that, what happens, if that happens? Well, a couple things do happen. People do re achieve some measure of compensation, notably, um, the children and classes affected by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. But that is far from the end of the story. You've got classes going back to 1990 that have sub been subjected to the same horrors. And you don't achieve uh, the next step in it, which is ending the discrimination. And, and it's why, um, and I won't put words in her mouth, it's why Dr. Blackstock had the courage to trust a government that she had no reason to trust and sit down with us for six weeks, along with AFN, who had no particular reason to trust us either, along with the Chiefs of Ontario, along with Nishnabiaski Nation, and say, what are we looking at? What are we trying to solve for? We're trying to solve historic compensation for people that we've said uh, deserve historic compensation. We're also trying to fix the system so that as soon as the appeal is dropped, we're not in court again with the same set of issues. And so on that note, um, and this, the Prime Minister has been has been intimately involved in this, and the Minister Heidi and I have been briefing him every step of the way. He said, this has to end. And so uh, we came up with, um, we, we gave a mandate to our teams to say, let's get this done and sit down at the table. And these have been very, very difficult conversations. And there are some term that, that, that do remain. But when I say we have to look at this in a comprehensive way, um, we could have just ended the appeal and we would have been in court the next day. Uh, and that's that's the point here is we are, we are moving forward on fixing a broken system. There's $20 billion to do that. It's in a 40-page document. Uh, and we're moving towards a comprehensive settle agreement for a whole class of people that were affected by a discriminatory system. And I think that's important to remember today. I think Minister Lametti can, can speak more about uh, what, at what stage the abeyance of the current appeal is at. Uh, thank you, Mark, and, and, and thank you for, uh, for allowing me to participate today in this historic day. Uh, and thanks to all the leadership groups that are here and representing and well representing your peoples. And 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 as as Minister Miller said, as others have said, we we did this for the kids. You've seen the complexity of these various cases in different in different legal fora, the Human Rights Tribunal, as well as in class actions, as well as trying to fix the problem moving forward. So we're we're committed. We committed ourselves to to settling this at the negotiating table, where we could get uh, a proactive. Uh, solution moving forward that compensates as well as helps try to fix this for the future and so for that reason when we do get a final agreement it is our intention uh to drop uh to drop the appeal uh it is um 
uh, first in front of the federal court and then and then getting a, a, a an order from the CHRT that we have met uh, their compensation uh, orders. Um, so that is our intention. Uh, and and in the meanwhile, the 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 abeyance will uh, will move to to uh, keep the abeyance in order until that final order. And I think all parties agree to that because and and I know that Dr. Blackstock has said this. Uh, as well, it is it is uh, something that is out there until we get a final agreement, um, and then once we get the final agreement, it is our intention to drop it. And a lobbyist, Fanovich, CBC News. I realize some of the details still have to be sorted out, but can you guarantee that each child and family won't will receive forty thousand dollars each at least? That no one will receive less than that? And how much are lawyers expected to get? How much are the legal fees expected to be? Well, maybe I can tackle some of that, and then we do have some lawyers on the line that might want to speak about their work. But I will just say this. Um, our understanding is that, and our expectation is that $40,000 is the floor, and there may be circumstances where people are entitled to more. Um, again, with the acknowledgement, um, and having been someone who's, you know, uh, who comes from Thunder Bay, like Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse, and has interacted with many Indigenous families affected, by a system that has been cruel and has been discriminatory, knowing that $40,000 is not enough to make someone whole, but it certainly is a step in the right direction of acknowledging the harm that's been that's been experienced by individuals. Um, I maybe will turn to the uh, legal folks on uh, that are representing the class action that can speak to legal fees. Right, uh, as I mentioned before, none of the money that's being allocated towards compensation that is to say the 20 billion dollars is going to cover legal fees or the administrative costs of the settlement those will be uh determined over and above and the way class actions work is uh we'll either come to an agreement with canada on the amount of legal fees and then submit that to the federal court for approval the federal court has to approve legal fees as being fair and reasonable uh, if we can't come to an agreement, we argue it in front of the court, and the court will decide what the legal fees should be. So uh, to answer your question uh, simply, uh, there's no amount that I can tell you uh, in terms of what will be paid for legal fees, because we don't know. Uh, we'll either agree to that, submit it to the court, ask them to approve it, um, or we won't agree to it, and we will argue it in front of the court, and the court will determine in a public hearing what is fair and reasonable uh, for legal uh, fees that are being drawn on a contingency basis. Hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And how confident are you that another generation of First Nations children won't be discriminated against by the federal government? Well, I think this sets the foundation um, nicely to end the discrimination and racism, but it isn't without a lot of hard work uh, on behalf of everyone. Because of course, um, harms are intergenerational and communities, I think uh, Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse talked about the challenges in particular, for example, in remote communities in terms of accessing services and having supports. It's interconnected with other discriminatory practices and other lack of funding experiences that First Nations communities have, you know, have live with every single day. And so our job as federal politicians is to continue to fight for equity in all of the systems that serve Indigenous people. Um, and again, I will repeat that it's not just good for Indigenous people. It's good for uh, it's good for the country, the future of this country, when every single person has a fair chance to succeed. Bonjour, Boris Prou, le Boris Prou from Le Devoir. My question is for Minister Miller. We understand that the agreement needs to be finalized by the Human Rights Tribunal. Do we have an idea of how long this will take and how long before people receive money in their pockets? Answer. What we'd like to see is to see things happen as soon as possible. There's a process unfolding between now and March 31st between the parties. We want to make sure that we have a finalized agreement. We're talking about a lot of paperwork, a lot of agreements in principle that have been agreed upon between the parties, but there's still work to be done. There's a lot of paperwork left to be done. 
we need to arrive at a final version of the document, submit it to the court, and then finalize the long-term reform. So overall, we're talking about a process that will be spread over the next year. There's one critical moment on March 31st. That's the deadline to depose the final document. So there's a lot of work and negotiation that will happen between now and then over the next three months. With regards to compensation for the affected people, Mr. Spurn said it quite eloquently. There are discussions that remain to be had between the people, but we want people to see money in their pockets as soon as possible. But again, this is the proce a process that will unfold over the next year. Question. So about the next part, the long-term reform to solve systemic issues, you were talking about the about C92 that's been contested by Quebec. Will this Will this be an impediment to your projects? Well, cert answer, it certainly doesn't help. It's not just Quebec that has issues with C92. They've taken us to court. They are contesting our authority or, or jurisdiction. But know that C92 is an act that speaks to the right of auto-determination or of Indigenous people. So whether... I don't like that provincial governments are trying to put this on the backs of Indigenous peoples. So what this is doing is leveling the playing field by setting a minimum investment through reform. So we're putting in conditions to allow C92 to move forward. We're talking about fighting poverty, about prevention, intervention. Minister Haidu mentioned this earlier. Discrimination takes many forms. There's discrimination that was done by the federal government that's what we're talking about today, but every child that is being removed today is being removed by a provincial institution. So there's a lot of mess to clean up. This is the start of what C92 was aiming to do. The right to of self-determination is something that we sh almost tend to take for granted to protect our children. But there's many things we're trying to do. The federal government is doing its job. It's investing in the communities, investing in reform to stop the harms that are being perpetrated against young people in Indigenous communities. 50% of children in child services are Indigenous, even though they only represent 7% of the population, and this has to stop. Uh, Fraser for uh, APN National News. Um, so it's, uh, this is a, for the children covered under the class action lawsuits. It sounds quite likely like they would be potentially much larger than uh, $40,000 just for central services denied, things like that. Is there, well, I guess a couple questions. Any idea how, um, from the lawyers on these uh, files, how much those that compensation may be uh, for these individuals? And does the government want to put a cap on that? I'm going to suggest that Rob Googler answer that question. And just to, but I can just say to your last point, the cap is is $20 billion. There's no other cap. That is entirely up to the plaintiffs in consultation with experts, communities um, to determine. But Rob will have more details on that. Thank you for the question. We intend over the next um, three months to discuss with our partners the appropriate breakdown of this amount of compensation. And $40,000 will be the floor for the children who were removed, but we want to find ways to give significantly more compensation to those who suffered the greatest harm. There's no cap. This will be determined in a model that we will come up with to be approved by the court. And we will come up with a model that minimizes the trauma associated with individuals making claims. Okay, thank you. And next question is for the Justice Minister. Is uh, one of the things that you're still trying to clarify, maybe by holding the appeal, is what 
clarify what exactly uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal rulings um, sort of uh, maybe some more specifics on that, I suppose. Is, is that part of, I remember in the initial when they stated the appeal, that was a concern, I think, in the documentation. And um, so are you looking for a bit of more uh, maybe clarity on that? Uh, maybe there could be some fear by the government of having a very broad understanding of these tribunal rulings and it could open up uh, lots of lawsuit, lots of compensation claims. Look, thank you for the question. We're not trying to do that here. We're here for the kids. We're here to solve the compensation questions uh, at the negotiating table in a way that covers everybody, in a way that covers both the removed kids and the, the Jordan uh, Jordan's principal classes of kids, because this is the just way to do it. This is the only way I think we can we can all frankly sleep at night uh, and and move this forward to achieve justice. So we're not trying to we're not trying. We, we felt we had legitimate claims in the court processes, but we decided as a government uh, in consultation with uh, the various Indigenous leadership groups you see before us, uh, that the best way to move forward was trying to settle this. And so we're here to settle it. This is today's about the kids. Uh, whatever might happen down the road, ongoing reform or, or, or whatever with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, that's, that's a question for another day. But today we're here for the kids and we're here only for the kids. Okay, operator, I think uh, we're trying for three to four people. I think we can hopefully get through before we run out of time. So please take it away to the first person on the phone. Thank you. The first question is from Kirsty, Christy Kirkup from the Global Mail. A vous la parole. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, with all due respect, um, as you note, the federal government took a very clear position in court on the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case for a very long period of time. And I'm just wondering, what role did public shame play in uh, reaching these agreements um, with the parties? Well, maybe I can attempt to answer, uh, Kirsty, and I'll just say this. Um, you know, this, this is... Um, this is overdue. And I said when I was first appointed as Minister of Indigenous Services Canada that litigation was serving no one any good. I had the support, of course, of the work of Minister Miller and uh, clearly of the Prime Minister. You cannot come to an arrangement like this if the Prime Minister is not solidly behind a negotiating mandate that is of this size. And so um, the time to move forward is now. And I think, uh, it, you know, quite Arguably, it could have been earlier, absolutely. Um, I hope that this is a lesson that our country will learn and will learn for once and for all, that discrimination, um, not only is it, um, and racism, not only is it extremely painful to the people that are experiencing it and devastating to lives and communities, but it is extremely costly to the federal government. Um, it is also a lost opportunity. I reflect on the names of the individuals that the, um, that the lawyers spoke about that you know were willing to put their names to the class action lawsuit. But I think about the many, many people in my own circles prior to politics that I met um, that had devastating lives and that had uh, devastation in their children's lives as a result of discrimination and racism of this country. I think. Um, you know, we should never have to be pushed again to do the right thing by children of this country. Um, maybe I can turn to Chief Woodhouse to say a few more words about about the work that you've been doing over the number of years. Absolutely, thank you, Minister. You know, that's a good question, but I I always believe that it's you know um, it's better when we're when we're at the table, as I said um, a month ago and. It's better when we're at the table and sometimes they're, you know, as, as opposed to in court. And I can't go into too much details, but over the last few few weeks, it was better that we were at the table talking face to face, having really hard discussions and pushing each other. Uh, you know, I pushed hard, but it, but you, we have to correct the wrongs that have been happening in this country for far too long for First Nations children, First Nations families, and the elders who are watching this, who were horrified, you know, I remember, um, you know, I didn't want to talk about this, but, I, but I'm going to say it, you know, and 
uh, my grandmother, my mother was telling me that my grandmother um, didn't like the system. She didn't like, you know, when it was being imposed on our people back in Manitoba and that the way that it started to, to crumble and go and that shouldn't have been the way that we treat our most precious little ones. You know, and sometimes, um, you know, in, in Manitoba where I come from, it's, it's you know, kind of it's become the epicenter of child apprehension in this country, possibly even the world. And that has to stop. We have to, we have to keep our children and families together and we have to give them opportunities to have the best lives that they can. You know, I'm the mother of two little boys and every single day I, I work hard to, to make sure that those little boys have a good life, you know, and their, and their father who's here helps me all the time. And every child deserves that in our communities. And sometimes if there's problems or issues, you shouldn't just rip our family apart. You should, um, you know, people, you know, should, we shouldn't be discriminated against, you know, based on if, if there's ever a, an issue somewhere, even if it's a small issue, we need to, work through those and, and move towards making sure that our families stay intact in our First Nations communities across this country and with their families without, um, you know, a number on their, you know, the discrimination on their, right on their head as soon as they're born, you know, or, or the, the, you know, there's been many ish issues and, and public things, even in Winnipeg, where a mother has her child taken right from birth that has to stop, the birth alerts have to stop across this country, you know, and I know, you know, to the mothers out there waiting to, to be reunited with your children and the fathers, don't lose hope, keep pushing, keep, you know, we, and we're here and we're all trying to work together. And, and these are hard discussions sometimes, but we have to, we have to stop and we have to work together and we have to have these hard discussions as Canadians, First Nations and Canadians. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, if I may, uh, also questions for the, the ministers, but I'm wondering what you've learned as a government that will ensure that discrimination is brought to an end. Uh, today's statement from Indigenous Services acknowledges that there has been discrimination by the government against uh, First Nations kids. So w what can you draw from this in terms of lessons? I'll start and maybe Minister Miller can add. Um, uh, for, for me, um, I'm in politics because I believe that when every person in this country has a fair chance to succeed, our country is stronger. It's been the driving force for me to be a politician. It's, I believe, the driving force for my colleagues who are around the table. Um, I hope the lesson that we're learning, as I said earlier, is that discriminatory funding for Indigenous people in this country is not just harmful and wrong and morally repugnant, but that it is uh, shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of uh, prosperity for the entire country. When Indigenous people see themselves as uh, hopeful and well and participants um, in their own communities, in the broader economy, uh, in the future of the country, all of us thrive. And so my hope is that um, this work that we've done with our partners, uh, including, by the way, Anishinaabe Aski Nation on things like northern remote quotients that have far too long been ignored, uh, will be um, a lesson for the future of the government of Canada, uh, regardless of who is leading it. Because, of course, this is broader than one party. It's broader than one prime minister. But this is a very good foundation to start having conversations um, and instilling, um, instilling a way forward that is built on a foundation of equity. Yeah, I'll, Christy, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your first question because I think it's tied to your follow-up. But yeah, a hundred years ago, Dr. Bryce was highlighting these practices that saw 25% mortality rates in residential schools. That was shameful. Um, and no one listened to him. Um, there's lots of shameless people in this society. Um, there's a lot of politicians that are shameless. If the truth causes shame, then um, so be it. And I think 
you know, you do, as a politician, feel shame, but you also have to do stuff and, and, and try to fix the system. And it, there's 100 years that have gone by, and in this case, 30 years, and there's plenty of shame to, to share. Um, but it's been on the backs of Indigenous children uh, that haven't had a fair shot in life because of our practices as a country. Um, the, I think the reminder for us, for cabinet, for our government, for any politician, any aspiring politician, anyone, anyone, uh, any, any person in Canada, is that in these cases there is a cost to inaction, um, and we've seen that in the courts, and this is very costly. Um, and when it comes to reconciliation, I think we all have to realize once and for all that you, you can want reconciliation all you want, but it ain't free. It, there's a cost to it, uh, but it's an important one. And in this case, it'll allow, um, it's an important step towards uh, some sort of equality. Can I just add, Christy, quickly to what Minister Miller has said? This isn't an end point. This is a, this is a, a point along the way in, a, in, in what, uh, Grand, what Chief Abram said, described as the two row wampum. It's going to take a long time to strip away the layers of colonial structures and the layers of systemic discrimination, systemic racism, and ways of thinking that have been brought about by uh, colonial structures. It's got to be our national project to achieve that. This is a, a positive step along the way, but we need to keep moving forward in every uh, sphere, uh, working together with uh, Indigenous peoples and, and their leadership in order to get this done. I'm trying to squeeze two more journalists in. Can we drop the supplementaries and just uh, one question from the last uh, two journalists and then we'll wrap this up. So, operator, the next person, please. Certainly. Next question, la prochaine question, Wyatt Sharp from the Wyatt Sharp Show. Please go ahead, vous la parole. Hi there. I'm just going to ask, I believe it was mentioned um, at the beginning regarding the eligibility of the compensation and how it's not yet known and how it'll be determined amongst the different parties. So can you, um, to one of the ministers, um, can you speak about the eligibility of the compensation, but specifically uh, what factors you would like to see taken into consideration when determining the eligibility of the compensation, specifically for the $20 billion that has been allocated to survivors and families of abuse? Well, thank you, Wyatt. And first of all, thank you for being a young person. Um, interested in covering this story because um, I think this is important for all young people to know and uh, hopefully your young audience is listening. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, this settles a number of class actions but will provide compensation uh, to hundreds of thousands of uh, Indigenous people who have been affected by uh, discriminatory and racist practices um, by the government of Canada, indeed by provinces and territories in the way that we've supported Indigenous families and communities. Um, it's hard to say right now how many people and how um, that compensation will be determined. That's the work ahead and it will be Indigenous led, it will be First Nations led, uh, so that First Nations people and communities and leaders can ensure that the compensation is correct and right and also, I think, importantly, delivered in a way that is um, is is safe and not re-traumatizing to people. Could I just add that uh, if you have questions about eligibility that are known now and that can be answered now, as opposed to those that have yet to be determined, I would ask you to go to the frequently asked questions that I mentioned uh, in my earlier remarks, uh, and I can now give you the link. It is uh, SOTOS Class Actions, S-O-T-O-S, Class Actions, all one word, dot com, forward slash F-A-Q. Um, and that will give you the best that we can give you right now that will answer the question of who's in and who's out. Thank you, merci. Next question is from David Aiken from Global News. I will have one. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the question. Let me turn my stuff off here. Um, a very quick question for, uh, I, I'm going to do double barrel here. Just want to get a sense of the potential number of uh, victims who will be compensated. I think Regional Chief Woodhouse mentioned 200,000. So just someone in Ascension just say yes or no. And a bigger issue, and I, I'll put this to maybe Deputy uh, Grand Chief Narcisse. Um, over the years, as I watched many communities in NAN, uh, many communities with the Muskegon uh, Council, 
lurch from crisis to crisis, out of Wapiskatch, et cetera, et cetera. I would ask some leaders, i say, how is it that the Cree communities on the east side of James Bay in Quebec seem to be so much more prosperous than those in the western side of James Bay? And the answer is often, well, take a look at that 1971 agreement the Cree signed, uh, the James Bay Project, that those communities have control over their lands. That gave them the resources to turn themselves around and become healthier communities. So I wonder, as I think about that 1971 agreement, does this agreement, um, Deputy Grand Chief Narcisse, have the potential to have the same kind of transformative effect on some of the communities in Nan and potentially in Manitoba? Is, is this that kind of deal that gives leaders in your communities the resources to build healthier communities? Hello, uh, thank you for that question. And uh, yes, uh, uh, this provides an opportunity for our First Nations within the Shabby Nation territory to really look at uh, the community-based challenges that we have. And it gives an opportunity as a First Nations-led process that they will have community-based solutions uh, moving ahead. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, respecting our First Nations jurisdiction over their children wherever they may reside. And how is that going to be reflective in the work that's happening uh, ahead? Uh, we have to take into consideration, too, that even within uh, Nishnabiaski Nation, uh, we are very diverse. You know, we had, you talked about the Mishkegwuk. Uh, we have uh, the Matawa Tribal Council. We have Shipogama. We have Windigo. We have Independence. All various degrees of uh, diversity in terms of some of the challenges. And I think this is an opportunity within the... Uh, uh, within the AIP moving ahead gives an opportunity for all of our regional areas uh, to really determine how child and family services reform is going to happen, how this compensation uh, is going to be allocated. That's the important work that uh, lies ahead and uh, we'll be taking direction from our individual First Nations in that regard. Uh, as NAN as an advocacy organization, uh, we, we go by where our First Nation communities uh, direct us. And, uh, you know, we are, we are putting in place a opportunity, uh, a process, uh, a protected process where our First Nation communities could help, uh, could also direct uh, and, and give mandate to how uh, this reform is going to be reflective of the needs of their individual First Nation communities and uh, what is going to be happening in those uh, negotiations as well. So uh, we're, of course, very cautiously optim optimistic in these, in these talks, but uh, this uh, agreement in principle sets the stage for the opportunities for our First Nation communities uh, to lead those ne negotiations. This is what we have, this is what we need, and this is what we want uh, in terms of uh, moving forward. So anyway. I think uh, Minister Miller did say we we seem just when uh, when we were speaking just a moment there he, they would have time for one more if I'm correct with that uh, was I correct with that yes so uh, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot by saying that so I think we can do one more solo question and then we've got to move on. Thank you. Next question is from Dylan Robertson from the Winnipeg Free Press. I will la parole. Please go ahead. Uh, hi there, uh, Mr. Stearns, could you please break down the number of people that might be eligible for compensation? Chief Woodhouse mentioned that we could be looking at more than 200,000 people between the two groups. So I'm wondering if you have any provincial or territorial breakdown, and if you have any sense of how many fit into the Jordan's principal group versus those in the apprehension group. Um, I'm going to turn that one over to Mr. Kugler. Thank you for the question. So. Um, we, together with Canada, hired experts to help us get a proper estimate of how many children are affected. And for the subclass of children removed from their homes, since 1991, our experts have given us the opinion that we are looking at 115,000 children. And that's the enormity of this case. 115,000 children separated from their families as a result of the system that finally is being reformed. With respect to Jordan's principle, it's a bit more challenging to come up with a figure. However, based on the data that is available, since 2007, we are looking at approximately 60,000 individuals 
and we need to extrapolate that data going back to 1991. So it's likely more than 100,000 children affected by the principles underlying what is now known as Jordan's principle. So if you take that amount, where, which you have more than 100,000, plus the 115,000 children removed from their homes, you're at in excess of 215,000 already. And that doesn't include the family members of those children. So we have, we have estimated several hundred thousand. We can't be more specific than that at this point in time. And to your specific question of whether there is a breakdown by province, we do not have that information at this time. All we can say is this class action settlement, if it is approved by the federal court, will enable all children removed from their families uh, to benefit no matter where in Canada they are from. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.